It's a follow-up to yesterday's um, brief videos about figures during the Irish War of Independence and the surrounding era. I thought we'd do Liam Lynch, as someone mentioned him in a comment. Um, Lynch was one of the major leaders on the Republican side during the Civil War. Um, again, bear in mind I'm making these for people outside Ireland or from non-Irish backgrounds or non-Irish descent, and they won't know these facts. So if you are from such a background and point and weigh in, do bear that in mind that some of it will be very obvious to you, but it wouldn't be obvious to them. Okay, Liam Lynch, Irish Republican. Uh, Liam Lynch was an Irish Republican army officer during the Irish War of Independence. During much of the Irish Civil War, he was chief of staff of the Irish Republican Army. This is, by the way, why I'm using Wikipedia. It's just I'm just making basic videos. Where I could spend hours talking about Liam Lynch or the ins and outs of the Civil War, but we'd have people falling asleep on cups of tea and 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 asking me to shut the hell up. I think Liam Lynch was born in the townland of uh, Bournemouth, Gareya. Angelsborough, County Limerick, near Mitchellstown, County Cork, on the 20th of November, 1892. Um, Lynch is, again, like his opposite number, Collins, where he, he fell out with eventually, from what you might call the strong farmer-type background. They both started from a, a similar sort of background in a way, although Collins, I would say, was more cosmopolitan as he actually went to London and England and lived here for some time and actually therefore had a wider view of the world. I think that actually benefited him as he emerged as more of a pragmatist in the long run and was able to cope more diplomatically when they, it came to negotiations. People often comment that he got conned. I think, to be quite frank, realistically, if you're sitting on one side of the table at the Anglo-Irish negotiations and you're sitting with the biggest empire in the world at the other side, there's only so far you can push. Um, he joined the Gaelic League, I see, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, an organisation that's really now more famous in America and really has a limited presence in Ireland. Ireland itself, it's not really all that important there. Um, and I see he was sort of an apprenticeship in a hardware sh shop quite common for this kind of era for sort of boys who came from reasonably respectable farming backgrounds to do that, to become clerks in hardware shops or accountant, clerks for accountants or post offices and so on. In Cork, Lynch later reorganised the Irish Volunteers. I'm going to have to do a presentation, I see, on the Irish Volunteers because I keep mentioning them. And most people who are not Irish are not going to know who they are. Um the paramilitary organisation that became the Irish Republican Army in 1919, becoming commandant of the Cork No. 2 Brigade of the IRA during the guerrilla Anglo-Irish War. He helped character a senior British office, General Cutbirth Lewis, shooting at Colonel Danford in the incident. Lucas later escaped while being held by our eight men in County Clare. Lynch was captured together with the other officers of the Cork No. 2 Brigade in a British raid on Cork City Hall in August 1920. General Cuthbert Lewis, because he's actually um, reported to have said he found the, the gentleman who held him to be reasonably polite. There's a, a number of urban story, myths and stories about that one. Uh, let's see. I'm more really interested in his role in the in the in after the War of Independence. The War of Independence ended formally with the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty between the Irish negotiating team and the British government in December 1921. Lynch was opposed to the treaty on the grounds that it disestablished the Irish Republic, proclaimed in 1916, in flavour of a Dominion status for Ireland within the British Empire. This was one of the main sticking points over the whole Anglo-Irish Treaty. Lynch, however, did not want to split in the Republican movement and hoped to reach a compromise with those who supported the treaty, free staters, by the publication of a Republican constitution for the new Irish free state. But the British would not accept this, as the treaty had only just been signed and ratified, leading to a deeper split in IRA ranks. Both he and Michael Collins were on the IRB Supreme Council, and there's another organisation I can see I'm going to have to do some sort of small presentation on. 
Uh, Lin Chu, commander by far the largest area of any divisional commander, was elected temporary chief of staff by the Republican Military Council in March. Uh, he did not participate in the seizure of the four courts. I should point out that's the seizure of the four courts is generally seen as kind of the start of the of the civil war, especially the shelling of it, which occurred as as the seizure went on. As it notes here, the rift by the time the four courts garrison was attacked by the newly formed Art National Army on 28th June. Yeah, uh, with uh, it should be said, borrowed um, British Army artillery. Uh, civil war. On the 28th of June, Free Street forces arrested his party, including Cap DC, but Free Street generally, Owen Duffy, allowed them to leave the city. Um, Owen Duffy is also famous for his role as the leader of the Blue Shirts, the, the Irish, shall we say, um, junior Nazi party sometime later in history. Uh, let me summarise some of this rather than go on and on with it. Basically, uh, Liam Lynch's side was slowly worn down because, of course, it didn't possess the access to weaponry that the Free State and National Army did. They could call on the British to supply them with weapons to some extent, although they weren't entirely trusted. Uh, but they could call on them to an extent, and they were supplied with things like armoured cars, <laughs> um, rifles, machine guns, and so on where the Republican side could only use what it already had or what it could capture. And although they did capture some stuff like armoured cars and and have some initial success and actually start out with more men, it eventually became war, worn down by a process of attrition. It also talks here, I noticed, about some of the wonderfully unpleasant and horrible sort of um, atrocities on either side in the Civil War. That's something I will mention somewhere as well. Death. On the 10th of April, 1923, a National Army unit was seen approaching Lynch's secret headquarters in the Knock Down Mountains. Lynch was in possession of important papers that he knew had not to fall into enemy hands. So he and his six comrades attempted to evade them. To their shock, they ran into another unit of 50 National Army soldiers approaching from the opposite direction. Lynch was shortly afterwards hit by rifle fire from the road at the foot of the hill. Knowing the value of the papers they carried, he ordered his men, including soon to be Chief of Staff Frank Aitken, to leave him behind. When the National Army soldiers reached Lynch, they initially believed him to be Eamon de Valera. I'm not actually surprised by that, as they would do look somewhat alike to a degree. But he informed them, I am Liam Lynch, Chief of Staff of the Irish Republican Army. Get me a priest and doctor, I'm dying. His last work wish to be buried next to his comrade Michael Fitzgerald in late 1920. Fitzgerald had died after a 67-day hunger strike. Lynch was carried on an um, improvised stretcher um, manufactured from guns to Nugent's, formerly Walter's pub in Newcastle, at the foot of the mountains, and later was brought to the hospital in Clonmel. He was died buried two days later at Kilcrumper Cemetery near Fulmoy County Cork. You'll notice that how many of these figures are from Cork, buried in Cork, and so on. It, it's There's a good reason it's called the Rebel County. A lot of these figures' histories revolve around it. This is Liam Lynch's memorial, which is rather huge and was put up sometime after his death. This tower was put up to honour him by people remember him. Let's see if I can blow up the picture somewhat. It's amusingly quite a lot bigger than the memorial for Michael Collins, who is was, after all, the figure who would go on to be, in some ways, better remembered, although there are people who view Liam Lynch as the lost leader of Ireland who would have, and would have taken his side. This is an RT article on a book from, oh, what's it? Oh, like a year a bit and a bit ago. Or just under a year. To declare a republic, David McCullough on the life of Liam Lynch. Liam Lynch, Chief of Staff of the Anti-Treaty IRA during the Civil War, is seen by some as a Republican icon, an uncompromising defender of Irish independence. To others, he was a limited, obdurate fanatic. 
as the article points out, I think both would be simplistic perceptions of him. This recommends a biography by Jared Shannon. I haven't read this, I'll be honest. I'm just pointing it out to show that there's various points of view on the man. Some people would regard him as a fanatic who couldn't move off from a limited point of view and couldn't compromise. So others would regard him as a heroic figure. I'd say both are probably simplistic. Um, I think having done this, um, it would be a good idea if I did a small presentation just after on the Irish Volunteers. So I keep having to mention them because I mentioned this this era. And if I keep having to mention them and no one knows who they are, it's going to get quite annoying for the viewer. 